today is the chapter three episode of uh, my book and this podcast. And that is every musician's favorite topic. Uh, get your business affairs together and fair compensation. So I think if you take anything away from this episode, it's to talk about things in advance and to communicate in general, and then to get all of that in writing. Um, I have a super special guest on today's episode, legendary attorney and author Donald S. Passman, who I'm sure many of you know wrote All You Need to Know About the Music Business, which is considered the go-to text and, and guide in the business. Um, Don is on his 10th edition, uh, which is very wild. Um, the first one came out in 1991. Um, I've had the complete honor to contribute to uh, the last few editions um, on the modern marketing and, and DIY section. Communication is definitely queen uh, in life and as far as this chapter goes. So uh, first, I'm going to break down something many of you probably know. Um, the two uh, main rights in music are the master recording and um, songwriting. Uh, also known as publishing. We'll get in more depth uh, on songwriting and music publishing uh, a few episodes from now. It is important for you to understand the two main rights in music, the master recording and the publishing or, or songwriting. Um, and that goes for any, um, any music you ever hear. So I've talked about this, but one thing I love about the modern music industry is the option for artists to own their recording rights in particular. Uh, that's something that was basically impossible in the pre-digital era. Um, now most of us have access to a laptop and the internet um, and we can record and distribute worldwide um, at a fraction of uh, the cost that uh, we, we used to. But um, so in the pre-digital era, um, unless you're Fug Fugazi or Ani DeFranco basically, um, you had to sign with a record company. Um, record companies were able to fund uh, time in recording studios, which was like only one percenters could afford back in the day. I don't even know if one percenters could. It was just so, so expensive. Um, I know that feels like a different planet now. Um, and then labels also held the keys to distribution. So getting your CDs and vinyl um, out to the world when music was a physical product. No one, no one's gonna care about your career more than you do. So it is on you to learn a lot of these modern basics and start to build up uh, your fan base and create art on your own. And then a label likes to come in. Once in a while they'll come in just based on music, but if, if they haven't seen you post on your social media in months, it's like, again, like why should they care um, more than you do? I mentioned work for hires. Uh, no one should enter your studio space. Um, or leave your studio space rather without signing a work for hire. Um, this means you own the master recording, so there's no ambiguity uh, uh, later on. Um, also, if you are paying cash to players, producers, engineers, um, pay them half their fee up front and then half when they sign the, the um, completed work for hire. Uh, because otherwise, you know, paperwork can get neglected and it's really, really important that you have that taken care of. It's also definitely an industry standard, old school or new school. So if someone is weird about signing a work for hire, it might be kind of a red flag that they might be kind of a pain um, about business stuff in the long term. The other really crucial thing to talk about up front before you enter the studio is songwriting. Um, I think it's really important if you wrote all the songs that you tell everyone, you know, get together for a Zoom coffee or however people are communicating. Um, assuming you wrote the songs, say, I wrote the songs. <laughs> and if you feel that you contributed to the songwriting process at any point, you have to bring it up in the moment, like in the session or immediately after the session. Um, from there, everyone can put the songwriting splits down and I, you know, I, I would be curious what an attorney's preference would be. I would say email. Um, so everybody replies and everyone agrees and there's a digital record. Um, but the traditional way is uh, once you agree, you write it down, you write down the song splits on a split sheet, quote unquote, piece of paper, um, and everybody signs that. So I would say do both. Um, 
that should make the attorneys happy and that'll make me happy. Um, but yeah, that way everybody's on the same page and you don't have anyone, uh, you know, coming at you uh, months later, you know, saying, oh, I, I wrote on this song. You didn't know that. And, and holding up the release. It's, it's really unprofessional and, and really a shame when that happens. Um, if you do co-write with anyone, um, also include uh, in your work for hire and or in your split sheet or in your email um, that they their share is pre-cleared for sync, assuming that is cool with the co-writer. Um, I've never met a co-writer that's that it that that is not cool with um, because if they're off fishing or on yoga retreat and not online. Um, and you're not able to get their permission for a sync placement, you're probably gonna lose the sync placement. Um, this also empowers you to say to your sync team or publishing team or music supervisors that any co-writes are pre-cleared so those music supervisors don't steer away from that music seeing more than one writer and thinking like, oh, that's gonna be a pain to clear. So yeah, just be upfront about songwriting um, so you have a process and protocol in place. Um, I know nobody likes talking about anything, let alone money, let alone song, songwriting splits, but it is way less painful to have that group conversation and put a protocol in place um, than to uh, have someone come around later and, and say they wrote things and, and mess everything up. Trust me on that. If you're planning on releasing a cover song, you will need to secure a license from the Harry Fox agency or from that artist publisher. Um, this has become pretty seamless with the internet, so it's not anything to freak out over. Um, they're gonna help you purchase uh, equivalent streaming units for that song, um, but I promise it's, it's not that painful. So please uh, purchase a mechanical license if you are planning on releasing and monetizing any cover songs. Um, and finally, I think this is a really good time to get a group or a band agreement together. Um, when everybody's feeling good, that's when you do your prenup. Um, hopefully you never have to look at it and it just lives in a drawer. Um, again, if someone is, is paying for recording, paying for merch, paying for any promo, um, I mean someone in, in the band or group, uh, assuming you are a band or group, uh, they, should, they should be paid back before um, other band and group members are cut in. Um, they also should own the master as far as I'm concerned uh, because they paid for it. Um, and then you can split everything after that. And same with touring expenses. I'm not sure if I mentioned that for, for post vaccine time. Um, but yeah, once, once expenses are recouped by whatever, you know, band members laying out the costs of merch and recording and, and things like that, then you can all split everything um, equally after that, except for publishing. I do feel that songwriting splits uh, should be real. Um, I've had the privilege of working with, you know, huge songwriters uh, and they could command a higher um, percentage on songwriting just based on their names, but they don't. They're like, I wrote 10%, I get, I get 10% or I wrote 70%, I get 70%. So if it's good enough for some of the biggest songwriters in the world. It's, it's good enough for, for everyone as, as far as I'm concerned. You are obviously one of the top attorneys, not just attorneys, but people in the industry. Uh, however, you've inspired countless industry professionals such as myself. I'm sure I've told you this. I'm sure you've heard something like this a million times, but I found your book, All You Need to Know About the Music Business, when I was 13 years old at the mall in Wisconsin. And that's when I realized this could be a real job. This 10th edition is the most radical rewrite I've ever had to do in books history. Uh, and the reason is that the industry has changed so radically in the way that we monetize music. Um, from the beginning of the music business, back when people were selling piano rolls and wax cylinders, uh, music was always monetized by selling something. And the something was, you know, uh, a CD or a cassette or vinyl or something. Now, uh, it's not monetized by selling, it's monetized by how many times people listen. And I can only listen to one song at a time. Whereas in the old days, I could go to a record store and buy two or three albums at a time. So it's completely shifted the economic model. Um, and the way that the money works is I get paid more based on how many people listen to my song versus listen to your song. But unlike the history, there's only X dollars a month available to divvy up because it's a streaming uh, revenue from advertising and from subscription fees. That's the pool. Now the question is who gets how much of it? Never been true before. 
before, I could have a big selling album and it brought people to stores and that helped sell your album. Now, not true. I don't want people to listen to you. I want to listen to you. So it completely shifts the way music's marketed, shifts the way it's monetized, shifts the emphasis of what artists need to do to make money from the music. You know, one of the reasons I wrote the book is that so many people wanted to get started in music and just didn't know how. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to write a very easy to read, simplified overview of a pretty complicated business to let people get educated and understand uh, what they were getting into and how to do it. Well, you certainly did that. Well, thank you. That's and totally with your help on the how to get into it, because the whole DIY section came out of our conversation and your expertise in that. I'm honored. Thank you. As am I. <laughs> so, is there, this is a very open-ended question, but is there an ideal scenario for an artist in the modern era? I mean, they have so many choices on how they could do things. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, your expertise is probably better than mine, but I do know this, that uh, the record labels, if you want to sign with a label, which is a whole different question, but the record labels want to see engagement. They want to see you build social media. They want to see your music trending. They want to see your song getting more listens on SoundCloud or you know, getting out there and starting to build a buzz. Uh, very different from the old days when some NR guy would go, I believe in this kid, he's going to develop into something and I'm going to nurture him over two or three albums and have a career. Uh, and there are a lot of people who wouldn't be the icons they are if somebody hadn't done that. But today it's all about data, statistics, and already seeing something happening. Which means if you're a young musician, you've got to go make it start happening yourself. I couldn't agree with you more. Now, master ownership is something that I grew up hearing a lot about as a teenager in the 90s from people like Ani DeFranco, Janet Jackson, Prince, obviously, you know, writing Slave on his face. Um, and here we are in 2020, I, I teach management at NYU, and I was shocked, this was just in the fall, um, to hear some students not knowing that they could record and distribute on their own. So as master ownership is something artists have fought for, including your own, obviously, how do you feel about this topic in general? Because there are obviously pros and cons to any route an artist takes. Right. Well, if, if you can own your masters, you're way better off, period. Uh, if you want to sign with a major label and you don't have a lot of clout, that's not likely. Um, if you've got a lot of people chasing you and a lot of interest, and particularly if you're in the, uh, the rap or pop area, you have a much better chance of doing that and getting your master ownership down, at least down the road, if not right away. Um, but it's totally dependent on clout, and it's always better to own it than have somebody else. Do you think that the AM FM Act or something similar will ever pass in the United States? It's unlikely because mm -hmm. the broadcasters have so much legislative clout. Should we talk a minute about what that means? Sure. <laughs> um, in every uh, territory outside the United States, when songs are played on AM FM. Sorry to interrupt, but isn't it except for the US, Iran, and North Korea? It could be. Yeah, I think so. All right, then you don't want to thank you. I don't know about that. Okay. Every developed major country <laughs> around the world, other than the United States, uh, when a, a master recording is played on the radio, the FM radio, uh, the artist and the record company get paid for it. In the United States, the songwriters and publishers get paid, but not the artist and the record company. There's been a movement for years trying to put that into effect in the U.S. It's always been blocked by the people, not surprisingly, the own radio and television stations. And they were very powerful with the legislators who depend on them to get their message out when they want to get reelected, among other things. So it's never had a serious chance of success. The interesting thing is that it's becoming less relevant because most of the money now is moving over to streaming where the record company and artists are getting paid. Right, and, and also just to bring that example to life, obviously Aretha Franklin and respect is, is very often associated with that and there's countless other obviously amazing recording artists that didn't necessarily write the song. Um, and let me talk also a minute about the, the controversy, which is not a major one, but it's still brewing having to do with whether streaming should be paid based on per play or based on per user. And I'll explain what that means. The way that it works now, uh, let's say there's $100,000 that gets collected from streaming in a month, and then it's divided up on the number of how many times a song was played. So if it's $100,000 and a song with, and there were 100,000 plays, just to make the math easy, right? And I had 10,000 plays, I'm gonna get 10% of the $100,000, right? 
No, that's called per play or per stream. Mm -hmm. okay. there, there's an argument to be made, mostly by smaller and more niche artists, because it benefits them, of whether a fairer system would be to do it based on per user. What does that mean? That means that I share in the money that the people who actually listen to my song pay. And it sounds at first blush like that doesn't make any difference, but it does. And here's why. Let's let's assume there's a streaming service and there's only two subscribers, you and me, right? And we each pay ten dollars a month. Now let's assume that you only listen to artist A and I only listen to artist B, right? But I only listen a hundred times a month, and you listen to your artist nine hundred times a month. So under a per stream system, uh, my artist is going to get ten percent of whatever the company of our twenty dollars, two dollars. And your artist is going to get eighteen dollars. Right? If we did it on per user, my artist would get all of my ten dollars, and your artist would get all of their ten dollars. Right? So that I'm, I'm way oversimplifying, and the, it's not nearly as radical as I just made it sound. But it, but the, the the article I read about it, which is very unscientific, thought maybe it was about a three percent swing from the big players who dominate in most of the plays down to the middle class and lower class and niche artists. And uh, to me, it's a much fairer system. Yes, because it really rewards the people you know who are you know, they're avid fans can actually contribute to them. Problem is, it's really expensive to change over, uh, and you know, not sort of quietly, you're taking money from somebody and giving it to somebody else, which is always a bit political. So, I don't know how strong the movement actually is, but it's something that's I think fascinating. Our first audience question is from my amazing attorney Joyce Dollinger, who I know you just saw at a Grammy event. Um, so she wanted to know if if there's one thing that an artist should know, what what should that be? Or sorry, a, that a new artist should know, what should that be? What is one thing in recording and one thing in a publishing agreement that a new artist would be able to negotiate? Well, I'll give you something that's broader than all of those. Try to lock yourself up for as little time as possible and try to have escape hatches if things aren't going well. Any, any last thoughts that you might want to add? Uh, I think it's awesome that you're doing what you're doing. And yeah. uh, thank you always for your help with all, the, all, the, all you need to know about the music. It's a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you.